Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of The Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, there, I can look back and, and see a path of how I came to the knowledge I know now. Um, when I was... A, you know, I, I, I was, God t revealed himself to me personally. Okay. Um, I ended up, I was released from my sins, absolutely blown away and full of joy. I mean, blam. And anyway, I went into the church system, the church system, you know, tricked me again and, and tried to make me do Christian things. And anyways, I died. Again. Well, not died, but I just, I felt that death come upon me again. So the world killed me, then religion killed me, so then I would have no confidence in my flesh, right? I ended up really early because, I, I mean, I got killed immediately in the church because it just was so, so many burdens and you're so carnal and you had no, everything you were looking at was yourself and your sins and your your own deeds and how to fix yourself and not to think lustful thoughts and how to have ministry mints in your mouth when you're talking. I mean, just all the stupid minutiae. So that burned me out quickly. And so I was just searching and searching and searching. And so I found uh, some friends. And, uh, uh, you know, Chris Christie, Kelly Crumdick, you know, and Kelly's a part of our Discord group. And uh, they ended up uh, showing me the truth about first, you know, like Revelation 8, 29 and 30, you know, talking about how those who me foreknew, thus foreordained, you know, everything written in the past tense. I was like, oh my God. And then Colossians 3, 1. And then, then they got me kind of started in that direction. And uh, through the course of events, they kind of pushed, turned me onto this guy named Witness Lee. And so Witness Lee was a really great author. And I read the life study of Genesis, the life study of Revelation. I read Perfecting Training. I read several, Life Study of John. He's got several of them. And it's literally the life study. He's not concerned. He wasn't concerned with um, like what we think the church is concerned with in any way. All he was trying to do was to find out what the life of Christ is, how to use it, how to utilize it, how to glorify God with it. For what purpose do we glorify God with it? I mean, like he's getting into all the minutia. What does this mean? Why? How? How does this all work? You know, and then he would allegorize, you know, like, so if you would go and you'd see like when Paul allegorized the two mountains being Mount Sinai and and uh, and Mount Zion, and you start seeing how one is the one is Hagar, one is Sarah. Well, Paul allegorized so that you could see that everything in the bat in the Old Testament was allegorical, so that you could see a picture of Jesus and understand what was going on. Well, the religious of the time do not appreciate allegorical teachings. They don't. They they're too afraid of fucking up and going to hell, so they won't put their trust in that. You know, and so, but Witness Lee was boldly doing it and, and operating in the Holy Spirit before anyone was operating in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you right now. And so he was one of the most influential authors I've, I've ever had. Well, um, I haven't read any other authors for about 10 years. I don't read anything else. I just go straight to the scripture because I trust that the Lord will write his laws in my mind and in my heart. I used to write, you know, I used to read extra biblical uh you know, books. And I mean, it's probably been more like 15 years, really, because I just once you get to the point to where you where the Lord is showing you with his Holy Spirit, you have no more need for a teacher. And so I don't read other books typically. Well, um, anyway, there I'm just gonna say that. So Witness Lee is one of my mo the most and I happen to run into him first. Then I read C.S. Lewis and C.S. Lewis was um, it's like I could see he was the step before um, Witness Lee. And then the next step before that was Martin Luther. So we have the, I can see these guideposts where God had revealed the stuff. Because there's other people that were turning the time of Martin Luther. But when I read their stuff, I just, it was just, you know, it's just bleh. I don't, the Holy Spirit with me was just going, yeah, it's all right. You know, it's, it's, they've got some Christian truths and they're, they're, they're doing some Christian things and they're, they've had some insight, but they're not, they're utilized, they're, they're focused on that. Martin Luther wasn't, he was, he was blown away by everything that, what faith is, how to operate in faith, what's going on in faith, how this is the difference between faith and the carnal and blah, 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 blah. He was already starting to break that down. C.S. Lewis, um, you know, and he's got some really good books. I mean, there's like The Great Divorce, and there's 
but everything he, every word that he was so powerful was in his allegorical teachings. So if you ever get a chance to read the Circle Trilogy, it's going to seem like a, like a, I don't know. It's if you ever chant, if you not the Circle Trilogy, but the Space Trilogy, um, and there's some other authors that were here and there that blew me away. Uh, but more in their allegorical teachings was where I was picking everything up. I mean, Ted Decker's got a circle trilogy if you ever get a chance. I mean, and I know it sounds like a, it's like a teen book, but it, you know, and then there's like the shack and there's some other books that are just really cool allegorically speaking. But um, anyway, uh, just to make a long story short, I mean, I can tell you these authors were pivotal. I mean, there was uh, Brendan Manning, The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus. I don't, the ragamuffin gospel and all that stuff; those were really good too. But those are way, rungs way down on the ladder. But there, I can tell you, there's some very good books back then that I can read. There's, you know, Gene Coberlin's The Paradigm Quest, which I'm reading my daughter now. Um, you know, and for me, I see things in pictures, and the allegorical to me is much, much more powerful. Um, so when I go in the Old Testament, like the I see the temple, and the, the temple is to me is allegorical. I pick, I see that the temple is representing live action aspects of Christ and how this all works. You know what I mean? So I don't, I, you can't, for me, my brain doesn't work with you with lists and programs and, you know, and, and, and you do this and that and this and that. It doesn't work with me. I have to, I have to see a comprehensive picture. And once I see the picture, then I can start di dissecting it down and understanding it. And, uh, that's kind of like where you see, like if you see the burning bush, that's the whole picture of the of Christ and the church, that he is the vine, we are the branches on fire, but not consumed. You know, this is like the, this is the goal that, that, that God is trying to do with his people. And he showed it to Moses first. And then it's like Moses deconstructed that. You see what I mean? Um, and anyway, it's like, Everywhere you look, that's kind of how God does it. He presents his picture to the people that you see the temple, deconstruct it. Or you can see it being built, but if you come and look at it, and then you start deconstructing it. If you see the temple, start deconstructing it. But you can't, until you see the whole picture, I can't deconstruct it, right? Anyway, so so what, what Witness Lee was trying to do was to deconstruct how everything operates so that he could reconstruct it. And, th and this is where we're at today, to where Witness Lee, he, he couldn't get past a point. And, and it's like we just walked right by it because of him. Uh, one of Witness Lee's books is called uh, Perfecting Training. And it, if you ever get a chance, it is probably one of the most boring reads in the world if you're not looking for it and not seeing what he's looking for. And he was trying to identify how the flesh worked. I mean, he could see, he knew, he knew there was a soul, the flesh, the spirit. He knew the body, soul, spirit. He knew what was going on. He could see every aspect. He's like, oh, well, if I do this and I come from this, this is flesh. And if, but if I do this, this is the spirit. And he was trying to break it down and he couldn't see what the works of the flesh were accurately yet, which we see immediately, um, which is anything you do from the position of inadequacy in trying to appear righteous or to fit in or to do anything uh, according to your own sense of iniquity. Trying to construct something voluntarily or according to an image that you imagine. And he, he was like, he was right there trying to figure that out. And you can see it, but he just, it's like you could see the veil was not yet allowing him to see there. But he, he prepared everything for that whenever the next person was going to come, they could just go, oh, there it is. And then they can, they can rock on. And that's why we can see that the, the church is satanic. Why we can see that every, all of our efforts at trying to be Christians and all these other things only serve Satan and death. See, he never did escape quite completely. He was still oblivious to the facts of what he was doing. Because if you go back and look at his church... Um, they all dress the same. They all talk the same. They all use the same vernacular. They greeted each other the same. And they're trying to, to make unity um, by their own conceptions. So they, were, they, they saw that they should be one. And they, they saw the unity and how it would operate. And so they endeavored to be unified in everything. 
but it was kind of according to their own will and according to their own mind and according to their own understanding. So whereas we've become one because we all laid down all that stuff and turned and looked at Jesus. And then the oneness of the Spirit produces the oneness in each of us. So we don't look the same or talk the same, but we all have the oneness of Christ, that we all point to Him and Him alone, that there is we have no confidence in our flesh and our ability to look at scriptures, discern them ourselves, and then manifest the image we think God wants. We can't do that. We know we can't. We have no confidence in our flesh, where he still had great confidence in his flesh. You know, and that's what was expressed in his church. But it was because God had not shown him yet. But we walk in and we go, oh, that's the flesh. That's what is all working. But you, you can see that God enlarged the flesh for him so that we could see it. And so that whatever he did, he might have done it. It might not have been accurate. It might not have been wholly complete. But what he did is it was like kind of like Moses bringing everybody right to the right to the Jordan. And that's what he did to me. Okay. So to let you know, he's probably one, he's very controversial. Everybody hates him because he was making a mockery out of Christianity back then. He was making a mockery out of the American church back then. I mean, mockery. Absolutely making everybody look stupid and everybody hated him for it. And so anyway, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, um, a little taste of his writing on, in, on the man child. And I want to show you the difference between what he's concerned with versus what other people, what other churches are concerned with today, because I'm going to tell you right now, the church is less now than it was even when he was there. It's even darker, you know, and he brought up an interesting point I was reading is that, that God gives more light as the church gets more dark. I mean, as the world becomes more dark and the church, because it's the church is concluded in the world, the fallen church that we know. And so as everything gets darker, he get, supplies us with more light. And that's what we've been talking about, is that as as everything is getting darker, we, we are ascending as they are descending. Okay? So anyway, without... Um, I just want to kind of get through reading this and give you guys a treat and give you guys a taste. And I'm going to continue reading his book and I'll, I'll do some more excerpts because the fact that I found this book, it's like a, it's like a, it's a, in a finding a needle in a stack of needles in a haystack. You know what I mean? There's no way that God brought the, I mean, I've been looking for these books everywhere I go just to, you know, just to see if I find them because, you know, and this one just happened to be boop, right in front of me at this thrift store. And I'm like, oh God, for two bucks. And if I, you know, if you go look up and see how much these are, how expensive these are. <laughs> anyway, which I, that's one thing I've had in contention with Living Stream Ministries, by the way, too, is to get these books. It is so expensive. They're like 120, I mean, really expensive. And I, I just, I think that, you know, and they were, anyway, I, they're really good books. They're very well put together and they are very worth at that price. But it's like more people need to get their hands on these books. And it's like, the, anyway, anyway, maybe I'll call them and bitch so anyway here it goes um so anyway he right now we're, we're talking about the is the woman with the man child in, in revelation 12 right and he's talking about the man child and if you want to know this is this is where you know i've been talking about us being the stronger portion about how we see things that the other that others don't that we're we're being plucked out of due time because we are um we're already been ripened you know, the other parts of the church, they're still like in infancy stages, but we're like the first fruits. And if you look at the in gathering throughout, you know, like Genesis and, you know, you start seeing the, the, the uh, Genesis and Exodus and you start seeing the, the first fruits and the different feasts. And you start understanding that whenever the first fruits went into the temple first. Um, anyway, it's so you'll see a lot of. What we already see, um, he was already seeing then. Okay. So let's just check this out. Um, again, this is 1976 this was printed. The, I was born in 1975. So likely a lot of these teachings were done when I was born. It's kind of interesting. In 12, uh, let's see. So the woman with the man child, we'll start with the woman. In 12.1, 
in 1 to 17, we see another symbol of the church, the woman with the man-child. The church is not only the lampstand and the great redeemer, uh, redeemed multitude, it is also the greater part of the woman with the man-child. No human mind would ever conceive of the church in this way. The woman in this chapter represents the whole body of God's people, and the man-child represents the stronger part of God's people. As there is a man-child within the woman, so among God's people there is a stronger part. This woman, who is bright with the sun, the moon, and the twelve stars, who is persecuted by Satan, the great red dragon, represents God's people throughout all generations. In every generation, a portion of God's people has always been persecuted by Satan. Nevertheless, during the three and a half years of the great tribulation, she'll be protected by God from the attack of the serpent. Okay? Um, as, and then this is going to be part B, the man-child. And this is, again, you're not, you don't hear any teachings on the man-child. But check this out. As we have seen, the man-child is the stronger part of the people of God. Among the people of God, even among us on the Lord's recovery today, there is the stronger part. This stronger part will be raptured to the throne of God before the great tribulation. In other words, the woman will be left on earth to pass through the tribulation, but the stronger part, the man-child, will be raptured to the throne of God before the tribulation. <clears throat> and whether that's Anyway, we'll talk. Let me, let's talk about that at the end because I don't know if we're actually. I still don't think we're going to actually be taken out. I think that we're going to be preserved in, and I believe that we're going to overcome, and then we're going to war against the principalities and powers while we're in the flesh. I don't. I we might be given an eternal body, but everything has to be witnessed. We can't be taken out of of where everyone can see. And this is where, I, he, where I, I, he's not totally, I don't know if I totally agree with him in, in every, you know, everything in, in the sense that he's talking right now, but I do agree with the, in the direction he's going. Okay. Anyway, so in other words, the woman will be left on earth to pass through the tribulation. And whether this is right or wrong, I don't know 100% yet. I tend to agree with him according to what I've seen, according to the natural teachings. Um. But I see that the, the church right now, the, the weaker part of the church, if indeed the church can be called the weaker part of the church, um, I see them going right with the world. I mean, as far as being punished and being blind, and they're going through the tribulation with them, where we have not, we're not. Because right now, I guarantee you, the great tribulation is already hitting hard. Because people all around you, look at them. They're just complete masses of shit. Although we haven't seen the massive persecution of the church yet, however, we see the church persecuting us. So, you know, and we haven't shed blood or anything yet, but you can see the tide is definitely turning. Okay. But the stronger part, <clears throat> the man-child, will be raptured to the throne of God before the tribulation. And I think that's, experientially, that's kind of where we're at now. But why will the man-child <clears throat> be raptured prior to the tribulation? Because God needs the man-child to fight Satan in the heavens and to cast him down. Although God has many angels who will fight against Satan, the final victory over the enemy will not be gained by the angels but by the man-child. God needs the man-child. God will shame Satan by using the very man Satan corrupted to defeat him. And again, and this is the only reason why I say that in order to defeat him, it has to be done in this realm. <clears throat> it has to be done in the flesh. The flesh has to be swallowed up. Death has to be swallowed up in victory. And that's why I don't, I mean, in a sense, we have been raptured to heaven. We are actively sitting at the throne room of God. You know, which I think is really interesting because I was reading, uh, what is it, Second Chronicles, when Solomon built his, his throne, um, which is really interesting because it was a throne made of ivory, but it had 12 lions on it. Again, that's interesting. And 12, again, is not just the, the actual number, but it's the number of his government. And the, and the, you'll see here in a minute. Let's just keep going. But I just think that's funny is that to sit on the throne as a lion with the lion. So, anyway. Okay, the final victory over the enemy will not be gained by the angels, but by the man-child. God needs the man-child. God will shame Satan by using the very man Satan corrupted to defeat him. And so that's where we're at right now, where the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal but the mighty to the tearing down of strongholds and anything in it, 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we're already able to do that. I can clearly see what Satan's tactics are. I can understand who he uses, the pawn pieces he's got on the board. I understand what's going on, and I understand how to defeat him now. And actively, we have been doing that. We have been yanking people away from him, one after the other. I mean, just kind of just look at the Discord group that we're having right now, if you're a part of it. Just look at how fast it's growing, and people are like, all of us are on the same page. So, um, anyway, that's interesting, right? Don't you guys think? <clears throat> God may say, Satan, you have corrupted the man I created, but I have got a man-child out of this corrupted man to defeat you. And he will not mainly defeat you on earth, but in heaven. And again, this is where we have experientially that we are actively involved in that combat. So he, at this point, hadn't actively seen what the actual war is. And we see it now. So anyway, it's interesting to me. The man-child will fight through and up, fighting up to the throne to cast down Satan from the heavens to the earth. This is a part of the testimony of Jesus. Although Jesus has defeated Satan on the cross, there is still the need for the church to execute his victory over the enemy. Because so many members of the body have failed in this matter, only the stronger part of the body, the man-child, will execute Christ's victory over Satan. The man-child will be raptured to the heavens to accomplish this job. And I believe this is why we've been given this knowledge right now, prematurely. We're, we, were, we were born out of due time. We were, we were the first fruits, you guys. Okay. The rapture is not merely for our blessing. We should not just say, how good is it for me to be raptured to the heavens? We must realize that God has a need for us to be raptured. We must be raptured to heaven that we might fight against the enemy. So, so as long as we are carnal, we can we're not in the we have no skin in the game. We are completely taken from the battle. We are absolutely ineffective for God. But since now we're learning to war in the spirit, this is where we're we're actually involved in the removal and the unseating of Satan in this world. Um, I can testify that Satan has been unseated in my in my conscience. He's been unseated as the ruler of my life. You all can testify that the same thing has happened to you by hearing this word, right? If when you hear this, you say, I don't want to go there and be involved in a war, this means you are not qualified to be raptured before the tribulation. If you do not go to heaven to meet Satan and cast him down, then he will come down to earth to meet you and overcome you. This is very serious. Because it says, the scriptures say that the, the church will be overcome at some point. But it says the woman will be taken, kept safe in the wilderness. But let's go on. Anyway. Um, we must be the man-child. I earnestly desire to be a part of the man-child. I am not satisfied simply to be part of the woman. I want to be included in that stronger part. This also is an aspect of the testimony of Jesus. And I believe that he is. So whenever, it's like whenever you have that first catching up, whenever the dead in Christ shall be raised up and then we shall be caught with them and which will remain, I'm going to come up to Witness Lee and give him a big fat kiss. Because man, without him I would have never come, I mean who knows, God would have done what he would have, but I, I've, I'm so grateful to Witness Lee. I mean, anyway. So let's go, we're going to keep going on. I'm going to read the first fruits and the harvest. And the Anyway, he's got a couple more messages. We have a little time. I want to go on. I'm just trying to get your get your uh, your curiosity peaked on this guy because he's amazing. Now we come to the first fruits and the harvest. 14, 1 to 5 and 14, 14 through 16. The church is not only the lampstand shining and the man child fighting, but also a field growing in growing a crop which must ripen and become mature. Any crop which is still green is too tender to be harvested. But once the crop has ripened in the field, it will be harvested immediately. Okay? That part of the crop which ripens first is called the first fruits. The first fruits will be raptured to Zion in the heavens before the Great Tribulation. As 14.4 14, 14, 4 points out, the first fruits are those who follow the Lamb wherever he may go. Okay? And this is why we have to be unemployed from all of our woulda, shouldas, and the law, and everything that is 
that is holding us back and keeping us carnal, we have to be completely unemployed from those. And that's why we have to have a sinless conscience. So once we have that sinless conscience, then we are unemployed from the works of the flesh. And now we can be employed to the works of the spirit. And because there is no image, we'll do whatever's asked. Whether it looks Christian or not Christian, whether it's up or down, whether we think it's good or evil, whatever the Lord has tasked us with, we will accomplish for him because we have nobody else telling us what's good or bad but him, right? So <clears throat> being the first fruits, they are raptured to the house of God in Zion as the fresh enjoyment of God or to God. This is for God's satisfaction. According to the type in the Old Testament, the first fruits of the ripened harvest were not taken to the barn, but into the temple of God. This indicates that all the early overcomers will be taken up to the house of God in heaven for God's enjoyment. And again, this is my experience now that we have that fellowship with him, that we are partaking of in the feast where we're, we're, we're partaking of his life and we're sharing his life one with another. We have this where we, we can testify of, of God's joy and we are filled with his joy. We know that we're that he's enjoying us right now. The rapture is not mainly for our enjoyment, but for God's enjoyment. The rapture is for the, the defeating of the enemy and the satisfying of God. We must not only be today's lampstands, but also today's man-child to fight against God's enemy and today's first fruits to satisfy God to satisfy God's desire. And this is cool. Um, anyways, and then we're gonna go let's check out the, what he says about the harvest. It's the next part. Following the first fruits in chapter 14, we have the harvest. Verse 15 says, Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the on the cloud. Uh, yep. Send forth your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest will be reaped near the end of the great tribulation. It will be raptured to the air where Christ will be on the cloud. Why will the harvest be left to pass through the great tribulation? Because green... Unripened fields need strong sunshine in order to ripen. In a sense, the great tribulation will be the strong sunshine which will ripen all the saints who will not be ready before the tribulation. Two, put it simply, if today if you do not give up the world and live for Christ, Christ will leave you on earth to pass through the great tribulation. And that is another motivator for us. If you're sitting on the fence, and you know there's several uh, people I know that are they agree with what we're saying but they don't want to give up their their family's opinions and they don't want to give up what people think about them and they don't want to be considered heretics and they don't want to be considered fools and, and they don't want people to look down on them and they don't want to lose their prestige and they don't want to lose you know admiration and all this other stuff that they're getting by uh just you know sticking out inside of the fallen church well you have to be, those have to be shucked from you. Those hooks have to be removed from you. And it's going to be by fire, you guys. So for some reason, God has put this, and then I, I can't claim any like special, anoint, me desiring God and why I'm chasing him. It's because he put this desire in me. I can't but follow the Lord. All I want is him. I don't give a fuck what other people think. I don't care. You can call me a heretic. You can tell me whatever you want. I don't care. I want to follow the Lord. And it's not because I have some sort of tenacity or because I'm faithful. It's not. It's just because I'm hopeless to the desire that I that I have for him. I, I just, anyway, I know you guys feel the same way. It's just ridiculous. To put it simply, if today, anyway, uh, Christ will leave you on earth to pass through the great tribulation. At that time, you will surely give up the world and realize that the best way to live is to live for Christ. All the children of God must do this. Otherwise, they could never ripen. If you do not believe my word, I ask you to wait. Perhaps you feel that the world is too lovely to give up. If so, the Lord may say, since you love the world so much, I will leave you with the world and let you find out whether it is really lovely. Then the Lord will shake the world and eventually you'll say, Lord, I repent. That repentance, however, may be rather late. Do not wait until the great tribulation comes to repent. Repent now. Sooner or later, every real Christian must repent. I have the full assurance that eventually every saved one will realize the world is not lovely, but poisonous. The more you love the world, the more you are poisoned by it. The world is at enmity with God. We must all despise it. 
Sooner or later, the Lord God, or the Lord will cause you to realize how much he hates this world. The day will come when all of us will be ripe. But do not say, I don't care about being ripe. As long as I'm saved, everything will be all right. You may be able to argue against me with your strong, stubborn will, but the day will come when you will realize that you need to ripen. I advise you not to wait for the harvest. By his grace, come forward and be part of the first fruits. Um, we have a little more time. I'm going to keep going. Because this stuff is, it, it's just so awesome. Because what we know now combined with what he says is like, oh my God. And he remember, he, he was alone in this. Everyone persecuted him. He had a, a, a following of people that followed him, but they quickly corrupted his teachings once he passed. I mean, quickly. It became the most legalistic, bullshit church. I'm sorry to say that, guys, but it did. Anything that I hear coming out of you guys now is just, it's so bullshit. Anyway, it's just like Luther, whenever they, when he quit, when he, when he stopped. Well, I got a kid coming in. You guys need help? You got it? Come on in, sweetie. So, you need to, what's wrong? You okay? What's wrong? Is it cold? What's wrong? What happened? Oh, you got a scary dream? Okay. Um, can I read one more chapter? Okay. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> got a little interruption with my little darling, my little treasure. Okay. Oh, Abby, hold on. You you move my this is my microphone. Stage. Okay. All right. You ready? Okay. So the overcomer. The overcomers over the beast. So in 15, 2 to 4, we see the overcomers of the beast. God is sovereign. Even during the time of the great tribulation, there will be some overcomers. Those whom we may call the late overcomers. These overcomers will pass through the great tribulation in which the Antichrist, the beast, will compel people to worship him as God and to worship his image in the temple. We expect to see the rebuilding of the temple in Israel. And this is coming too, but... I really think this is more spiritual matter and the temple being built now. Um, we expect to see the rebuilding of the temple in Israel, for this will be a sign that the Lord's coming back is very near. The Bible prophesies that the Antichrist will erect his image in the temple of God and will force people to worship it. During that time, many Christians will overcome the beast and be killed. So if you overcome, you're, you're going to be killed in the group. That's, that sucks. I advise you to be an early overcomer and to love the Lord today. Do not wait to overcome by being killed during the Great Tribulation. According to chapter 15, the later overcomers will be raptured to stand on the glassy sea, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and will praise God with the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Those on the glassy sea are those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. These are they who overcome the beast, his image, and worship the idol of the Antichrist. Revelation 24 and 6 indicate that some of the, the co-kings of Christ will be these late overcomers. I say, I say again that I prefer to be an early overcomer, not a late one. If you are sloppy, you will be left to pass through the Great Tribulation. We all must look to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be an early overcomer. We shall cover the details when we come to Revelation 15 in this life study. Um, and then he's got, and then this, this will be the last message I'm going to teach on, right, or read on. Um, but anyway, he says, this one's section six, and it's the bride. In 19, seven to nine, we see the church as the bride. Ephesians five reveals that the church is the bride of Christ, but it does not reveal the bride in such an intimate way. But in Revelation 19, we see how intimate is the church as the bride. In this portion of the word, we see that the bride will wear bright raiment, being clothed with bright and pure righteousness, and will be invited to the marriage feast to the lamb. This is a very intimate matter. To God's enemy, we must be the man-child for, for God's satisfaction. We must be the first fruits, and for Christ, we must be the bride. We are, when we are eager to be the bride, Christ will receive his satisfaction. Not only will Christ be satisfied, but we ourselves will be glad. Revelation 19.7 says, Let us re rejoice and exult. In principle, a bride is the most pleasant and happy person. Today, as a church, Christ's counterpart, we are suffering and undergoing many dealings, but the day is coming when there will be no more persecutions, sufferings, or dealings. I have never seen a bride who was dealt with on her wedding day. 
the oh, we must be the bride. When we have become the bride, all the difficult dealings will be over. Um, and we I got here, and so anyway, the church is also the army. Nineteen fourteen through nineteen seventeen fourteen. The the part of the church which will be the man child to fight against the enemy in the heavens will also be the army to fight with Christ against Satan on earth. After all the raptures have been completed, and after that the believers have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, all the overcomers will come back to the earth with Christ as his army to fight against the Antichrist and his army. Both Christ and Antichrist will have an army. Both will fight on the earth. In other words, Antichrist will fight against Christ and his army, and Christ will fight back with his army. The false Christ will be so bold as to fight against the the to war against the, the real Christ, but the real, the real Christ will war against the false one. In 1714, we see that Christ's heavenly army will be composed of all the overcomers, those who have been called and chosen. Eventually, at the end of this war, Christ will defeat the Antichrist. Ultimately, the testimony of Jesus will be the new Jerusalem, the beginning with the lampstand and passing through the great multitude, the man-child, to the first fruits, the late overcomers, the bride, and the army, and all the saved ones will eventually be the new Jerusalem, which will be the living composition of all of God's redeemed ones, the ultimate consummation of God's building of his people. In and for eternity, the new Jerusalem will express God in the Lamb and, and with the flow of the Spirit. When we come to chapters 21 and 22, we shall see a clear picture of this ultimate cons consummation. Anyway, um, I just want to give you guys a picture of, of what he's talking about and how it's different and, and why what we're learning now and what we're understanding is so important. And I'm not ruling out that there is the actual um, where we get caught up and raptured to Harpazzo, literally. And um, I, I see that, and it, it could be, but, but what's happening now spiritually is this very same thing that is mentioning because we're fighting on war in, in heaven and on the earth right now from the earth we we're ascended with christ literally right now and we're fighting against the powers and principalities right now so whether we get caught up and we do that there but i i, I still the, the thing that holds that holds me up on that is the fact that everything needs to be witnessed that everything on heaven, on earth, under the earth, and the seas needs to be able to see at one time what's going on. Everything has to witness it. So, I mean, we might be pulled up for a time or not, but I, I see that I've already been raptured. I'm already warring after the spirit. I'm already the man child. I'm already, I'm all these things that, that he's talking about that we should be expecting to see, we're seeing. We, we do have the, I mean, there's rumors of the temple in Jerusalem being built, but we also have us right now being built up as the temple so it's like christ comes in secret then he comes openly so for us he's come secretly to where we he's come as a thief in the night where we we know him and see him but the rest of the world can't see him we have the special revelation but later on there's going to be the full revelation but again it's going to be through us so there's still a lot of questions I have. I mean, I, I understand the traditional views and I understand all those things. And I, you know what I mean? And they still could be, but I just see there's so much happening in the spirit right now that is fully aligned with what prophecy said would happen that the world, we, we see the world in decline and we see many things manifesting carnally, but I'm more concerned now with about the spiritual side of things. And about everything being fulfilled in the spirit, the temple being built, which is you and I, the real temple of God. There might be the false temple being built too. Who knows? We There might be a, another great tribulation coming, but right now, look at the world and how effed up it is. And look how we're being protected from it. It's like we've been raptured out of it. You know, and it's because spiritually we're not being influenced by the powers of darkness that are that are destroying the world right now. So anyway... Who knows? I'm not. I'm not closing any doors on this one. But, but think about it now for you and for me and what we're doing. That we're actively involved with the battle against Satan. We've we're no longer fighting the carnal battles. We don't care. So, anyway, let me know what you think. And uh, if you see or know anything different, let me know. Um. Anyway, really wish we could all get together. That'd be so great. Um. And and just. 
get together and bullshit. It's just, I know it's so crazy that we're, we're all so far apart, but I mean, might as well utilize the technology, I guess. All right, my brothers and sisters, and you want to say goodbye, Abby? How come your face is so long? Are you a part of horse? Anyway, all right, my brothers and sisters, talk to you again soon. Bye.